Craig Johnson from Arms and Armor, and today we are going to talk about some concealed weapons in the in the uh, period, not only of uh, the Renaissance and medieval period, but up through even today, and about some of the aspects of that. That, in comparison to you know open carry, as we would say today, uh, weapons in and out throughout the period of time uh, were recognized as weapons, whether they were concealed or not, and oftentimes what we would consider today to maybe be non-offensive type weapons back then oftentimes were. You had the idea of what was your intent with it, which is included in our laws today. So whenever you approach something and you, your intent is to do harm with it, it can be a illegal thing to have. But if in the Renaissance and medieval period, you were walking about with uh, certain weapons. Some of those you would have been against the law because they didn't match the status in society that you uh, were at, or they may well have been fine. Um, in the medieval period, almost everybody had a small knife on them. It was a tool. It was something that you needed to survive to do your daily work or to eat or do whatever you had to do. Um, Sometimes people refer to, you know, like the quarterstaff, the ability to protect yourself with a large stick. This was seen as something that was a weapon. It was not necessarily something that you could just walk about and say, well, this is just my walking stick. Um, pilgrim sticks, walking sticks were usually a little different than quarterstaffs. They were a little shorter. Often a pilgrim stick would have a small hook on it so you could hang a votive or some type of symbol on there. Um, you do have the shepherd's crooks uh, where the shepherds would use the hooked shaped piece and it becomes a religious symbol. They are the shepherds of their flock and therefore you have bishops walking about with these large crooks, very ornate sometimes. And so the pilgrims that would be traveling say uh, on a pilgrimage to a holy site would often carry a walking stick, but it would not be necessarily a quarter staff. Um, there are some talks about different pilgrim staffs that maybe were weaponized a little. Uh, there's not a lot of evidence th through that, uh, but we do see in this period of time canes and the use of sticks as a very actual type of thing that was done in society. Uh, in reference, we have uh, 11th century or so, you have it becoming very fashionable for uh, women in the area that is now France to carry apple sticks. Uh, these were probably some type of self-protection or you know, being able to defend yourself in case uh, need be, but it was something that you see being uh, commented on in the period. And that continues throughout. Sometimes it's females that carry the sticks more often, sometimes males, it becomes very uh, popular in the Elizabeth, just prior to the Elizabethan and Elizabethan period for courtly gentlemen, nobles to have uh, long walking sticks or canes. They would often have very ornate tops on them, stand relatively tall so that you could kind of position yourself and keep your status upright and look very good do, uh, doing it. Uh, these types of things would have been status symbols. You would have be been declaring your wealth. Um, Oftentimes they would have been probably the same people that were wearing fancy rapiers. They might actually have a walking stick and a rapier. Uh, so you would see that as a popular thing, but it comes, becomes very um, quickly something that these authorities start to try and regulate. So when you get into say 17, early 1700s in London, you actually had to have a license to carry just a wooden stick or walking stick or cane. Uh, this is a real nice little purple heart cane that I've used for doing uh, training with canes for combat and such. But, a, you know, it's a stick with a little knob on the end. Works very well for walking as a, as a, as a support, but also is very effective in the concept of you could defend yourself with this. Now, when we get into concealing weapons, uh, you know, this is still going to be considered in that 18th century context as a weapon you're walking around with and you would need to be someone who was recognized by society as having some privilege and uh, the responsibility to carry such a weapon openly, right? Uh, when we see the addition of 
what we call concealed weapons start to show up. Uh, you do see some of these in this period of time. Uh, not a lot of them. It's probably much more of a thing that happens in the movies. D'Artagnan's rapier with the spike that shoots out the back. Uh, those kind of things are going to be done up a lot more in movies and you know, looking back in fantasy type things as opposed to in the reality because in reality a weapon's a weapon's a weapon. So if you're carrying something and it is a weapon like that, it is very much going to be something that everybody recognizes and says, oh yeah, that, that, that's offensive no matter if it's got a blade in it or not. Um, and this goes all the way even, you know, in the Renaissance you have pole arms, so there'll be an ax with, a, you know, oftentimes fancy, but they'll have gravity spikes, so it can turn into a longer pole arm very quickly by just slinging it and having that spike come shooting out the top of it, and it locks in place on a spring, but it is also uh, concealed in the sense that it's got that big long spike on it. When we get into uh, the period of time we're talking about now, where you start to see things where you have like a fancy uh, uh, walking stick. You can see this one has some gold inlay on there. It's quite a nice little piece. Uh, picked it up uh, several years ago. Uh, but this piece actually is a proper sword cane. A slight twist of the piece and it pulls out an elegant little blade with double fullers running down it. Uh, diamond cross section. This is uh, marked C. Hobart Lafayette Retaboul Paris, um, so it's numbered on a little spring even, but this particular piece would have been, you know, a blade that could have been used to defend oneself if you need it to be. Uh, it's a little longer than you see any of the modern kind of sword canes being done today. Usually they have very short little uh, blades on them, and that's because it's difficult to get a very nice straight cane that's going to hold up and last and uh, is going to be durable enough to handle any kind of use. Um, and then this one has just a slight twist, uh, slightly out of round shaft, slight twist, and it goes together and locks so it won't come apart. So that's, that's a sword came from the period, probably late 1800s. Uh, very nice, would be useful as a blade even in your hand. Um, you could also defend yourself with this. This has a little bit of heft to it. Uh, when we look at weapons sometimes that are looking just like a cane, this is what we call a warden's cane. And this has a spring steel rod that runs up through multiple leather washers. So if you get a real close look at that, you can see that it's just stacked leather washers. But that cane is quite flexible, right? It's got a little bit of weight at this end, but because that quarter inch steel rod is in there, this makes a very effective type of weapon, whether you are going to push a thrust with it or swing it and hit somebody with it. It's very effective, very light, very quick in the hand. Again, you could walk around with this and it would look just like uh, a, a walking cane, but this is designed as an offensive weapon. Uh, they called them warden's canes because oftentimes uh, they would be used by wardens in penitentiaries and such. Um, I don't know if that is, uh, I've never done the research on that as far as how closely they are associated with that or if that's just a name they acquired and everybody calls them that on eBay nowadays. Um, and then the reason we're talking about this today is uh, Nathan got, uh, came across this over the holiday and it's a riding crop. Uh, British officers are seen in all your World War I and World War II movies uh, holding these underneath their arm as they go. This one, like some of them that you see out there, actually comes apart and has quite a nasty little spiked blade. It's round in cross section. Comes at just a very fine, fine point. Uh, exceptionally fine little point on that. And the, the shaft is, you can tell, handmade. It's kind of hammered out. Uh, you can see some of the actual uh, structure of the metal in there where you're, you're seeing the metal was stretched out when it was forged. Uh, very thin little blade. Now how effective this is in hand-to-hand -hand combat is one of those things that again is a aspect of today or 
you know, in the modern mindset, having that blade in there is probably, you know, it's fine, but it's not necessarily going to be any more effective than if you used it as a weapon in and of itself. Something like this, maybe a little less, but especially like a cane like this, um, when I get that blade out, it's probably going to be very intimidating, but using a cane where I can hit someone quite effectively, even if it's just a wood cane, is a very effective weapon when it's used. Again, my intent, right? So if I'm walking around and it's just to support me, that is something that in the uh, context of today's laws, you know, it would be like, well, that's just, a, you know, it's, it's there for my use to help me walk. But if the instant I raise it up and decide I'm going to use it offensively, that's when the law starts to kick in on it. Back in the period, as we talked about, you know, those things would have been very much seen as weapons. Uh, whether the quarterstaff, a pilgrim staff, any of those things, you could see them as being used in an offensive way, and they would have recognized and, and reallocated or regulated that to a point where certain parts of society would have been, no, you, you shouldn't have that. You shouldn't have that at all. So um, those are some things about concealed weapons and such that you know you, we think about when we look at these things. Uh, we had these pieces from like the late 1800s on here. And then, uh, you know, those go back into the Renaissance and medieval period. You hear a lot of discussion about assassin weapons and things like that, concealing things. It was done. It's probably way more about um, us humans trying to figure out some way to do something that is, uh, in our minds, going to help. But in essence, it's probably no better than if you're very good with a knife and keep it in your sleeve and use it that way. So um, hopefully you found that interesting, some cool little pieces we've kind of collected over the years we thought we'd highlight. And if you have uh, any questions or ideas, put them in the comments below. Uh, thank you guys for watching and we'll see you soon.